update on Giving to Cadores. Many have asked us how to make financial donations to the church during this time that we are unable to meet together. There are two ways you are able to do so. One is by going to our website at www.cadoreschurch.org and clicking on the Give tab. There, you can click on another link for online giving. Also, you are welcome to send your tithes and offerings in the mail to the church as well. You can place your gift in your offering envelope and then in another envelope with our church address on it at Cadoris Church of the Brethren, 1129 Dunkard Valley Road, Dallastown, PA, 17313. Your contribution will be deposited promptly. We hope this is useful information as many have asked us about how to do it. We thank you for your donation and we pray for it to work in big ways for the glory of God. Good morning, and welcome to the Cadoras Church of the Brethren. We're so glad you invite us into your homes this morning. We're so glad that you're here. As I was preparing this message this week, the Lord laid on my heart something that I wish to share. You know, we hear a lot these days about pre-existing conditions. If you follow the news at all, those that are most uh, susceptible to the COVID-19 virus are the elderly and those with pre-existing conditions. Well, this morning I'd like to focus on a pre-existing condition that we all have, a condition that we have that no medical procedure or medicine will correct. It's a condition we were born with and we'll have it till the day that we die. When we talk about pre-existing condition, we usually talk about a medical condition that would prevent you from getting insurance or possibly if you could get insurance, that that insurance would not cover the pre-existing condition. But again, in this particular pre-existing condition, would not be covered. Medicine or surgery cannot correct. Have you figured out yet what pre-existing condition I'm talking about? I would guess that most of you have already figured it out. The condition I'm talking about is the condition called sin. It's a condition that separates us from God. A condition that pushes us away from the one who loves us more than we can even imagine. You know, many pre-existing conditions can kill you. For example, untreated fast-growing stage 4 cancer will kill you. An unattended enlarged, enlarged heart can kill you. Untreated diabetes and a person who chooses not to eat correctly will kill you. But sin will also kill you. The Bible tells us that this condition is deadly in Romans 6, 23, where it says, for the wages of sin is death. But unlike many insurance insurances, Romans 5, 8 tells us that God accepts us with our pre-existing condition where it says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The exciting thing about the love of God is that he will not turn us away. He won't turn away anyone who comes to him with repentance and accepts Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Let's talk more about this pre-existing condition, but before we do, would you please pray with me? Father God, we come to you today as sinners. We cannot deny it. We were born this way. But Lord, we also know that you accept us in this condition. We thank you for this, and we ask that you teach us how to be less sinful. Lord, help us to be more like Jesus. We thank you for this opportunity to meet together through the internet and in our homes, and we look forward to the day when we can all meet again in your home on Dunker Valley Road. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
So instead of having just one scripture today, I'm going to be referencing scriptures throughout my message. So how do we know we have this condition? Well, it doesn't take long by opening your Bible and starting at the very first book of the Bible, Genesis, where we find the first two humans that ever lived falling into sin. Let's recap. Genesis 3, 1 to 7 says this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, you may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewn fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Have you ever wondered what our life would be like if Adam and Eve would not have eaten from the forbidden tree? Can you imagine living in the Garden of Eden? Everything is perfect. There's no hurt, no pain, no dying. But unfortunately, God, when God made man, he gave him the gift of free will. And from the beginning, it has been man's responsibility to use it in a just and righteous way. With that, we see that the man has had the ability to choose to do right or to choose to do wrong. In these verses, it didn't take long for that free will to be tested. Unfortunately, we failed, and as a result, man succumbed to temptation, and sin entered the world. The serpent who appears in the story we know is the devil, or Satan. Satan here comes in the form of a serpent. And there is one reason, and one reason only, that he comes. That is to disrupt all the good that God has created to work against God in any way that he can, and to do whatever he could to create doubt in the mind of man. Unfortunately for Adam and Eve, they find out too late that the serpent cannot be trusted. They find out the hard way. Satan casts doubts by questioning exactly what God said and why. You see, God supplied everything that they needed. Man was the last of God's creation, and God had everything in order to sustain and fulfill all that they would need. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think of Eden, it brings to my mind paradise, lush with everything they would need. It would be more than enough to, for us to enjoy. I would imagine when they heard the sound of the Lord as he's walking in the garden, they wish they could have a do-over and things could go back to where they were. But they could not. And the subsequence of the fall would now come. Guess what, folks? We are all descendants of Adam and Eve. We all have this sinful nature in us. Every one of us. Our life, in some way, has said no to God and yes to sin. Sin entered the world through the very first people God placed on the earth and continues to this very day. God gave us free will as well for us to decide for ourselves. He could have prevented us from it, but then we'd be like a robot and we would not have any freedom at all. I never thought about it this way, but I read, if you would not be free to rebel against God, 
you would not have the free will to love him. Never really thought about that. That's an interesting saying. Temptation happens to each and every one of us. But Jesus came to set the captives free. Luke chapter 4 verses 18 tells us this. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has set me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To set the oppressed free. Now I don't think anyone would disagree with me when I say we need help. <coughs> Excuse me. We need help to overcome temptation. The temptation of sin in our lives. But you know, we need to take the first step. You know, there are a lot of programs out there that help people with chronic struggles. Most of them are done over a 12-step process. But do you know that almost every one of them begins essentially in the same way? Step one always goes something like this. I admit to myself that there's something seriously wrong in my life. I admit that I do things that later I regret and tell myself that I will never, ever do again. But then I go ahead and do it again anyway. I keep on doing them in spite of my regrets, my denials, my vows, and my cover-ups. <coughs> Sorry, I still have the cough. I admit the truth of where I am and that I am really powerless and need help. Can any of you relate to this? I know I can. You know, it reminds me of what Paul says in his book he wrote to the Christians in Rome. It's found in Romans chapter 7, verses 15 through 8 through 20, where he says this, I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do, not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this is what I keep doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin living in me that does it. Kind of a tongue twister, isn't it? Kind of funny reading it. But you know, it really isn't funny. Can you relate? Have you ever done something that you did not want to do? Step two that helps people with chronic struggles is a step of hope and faith and realization. It's a big step towards God. Basically, we say that despite all the failures in my life, all the broken promises, hard feelings, disappointments, the hatred, anxiety, depression, and guilt, there is hope. There is hope because there's a power out there greater than myself. I am incapable of doing it myself. I need God's help. It's all about being honest with yourself. And then step three is a step of letting go. Making a conscious and willful decision to turn my will over to the care of God. Step three is all about letting go. Ladies and gentlemen, you do not need to be an addict to drugs or alcohol for these steps to help you. You see, these are the steps that any of us need to take if we're going to grow in our walk with the Lord. Let's not be like the people back in Jesus' day when they saw him perform many miracles and knew that he could help them. <coughs> but they let their pride and desire get in their way. Let's see what happens with them as we read from the book of Luke, chapter 4, verses 22 through 30. 
Jesus' ministry takes him to Nazareth. He's in the synagogue teaching. This is another time where everything was going great until it wasn't, if you recall my message back on Palm Sunday. Here's what Scripture tells us. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, Do here in your hometown what you have heard, what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zephyrath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha, the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town, and took him to the brow of the hill of which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked through the crowd and went on his way. The people in Nazareth knew exactly where he was going with this. By Jesus saying this, he was implying that they were as unbelieving as the citizens of Israel in the days of Elijah and Elisha, a time that was notorious for its great wickedness. You see, it was bad enough to be told that they were poor in spirit. It was bad enough that they were told they were blind to the things of God, that they were a prisoner to Satan and their lives were in pieces. But now they're being told that they were less spiritual and less wise than the Gentiles. And that was too much for them to take. <coughs> so what do they do? They want to throw him off a cliff. Pretty drastic, don't you think? So how does this apply to our lives here today? Well, you see, it's all too easy to have the attitude of the people of Nazareth that says, I'm fine just the way I am. I don't need to look to the Lord and relinquish my will to Him. Remember step one of the 12-step program? Admitting that if we're going to grow in my walk with the Lord, I must admit I can't do it without Him. You know, folks, whether you've been walking with the Lord for six months or 60 years, the principle is still the same. We will never grow in our walk with the Lord if we don't think we need to. We will never become more like Christ if we think we're okay right where we are. Now, I don't know about you, but every day God's working in my life and showing me things that he wants to be replaced. But you know what the biggest hindrance is to receive those blessings? The biggest hindrance is me. I stand in the way. My pride, my arrogance, my self-sufficiency, and my unwillingness to ask God for help keeps me from growing in my walk with the Lord. Every day I need to remind myself that God loves me just the way I am, but he refuses to let me that way. In a large, prestigious church in England, a former, former burglar knelt beside a Supreme Court judge. After the service was over, the judge walked out with the pastor and said, Did you notice who was kneeling beside me at the communion service this morning? What a miracle of grace. The pastor replied, It is truly a miracle what God has done in that man's life. The judge, in a humble voice, then said, I was talking about me. What the fellow meant, when that fellow met Christ in jail, 
He left his life of crime and received all the hope and healing that Jesus could offer. He knew how much he needed help. I, on the other hand, went to church, took communion, graduated from Oxford, and became a lawyer and eventually a prestigious judge. I was sure that I was all that I needed. But you know, kneeling beside that fellow today reminded me that like him, I am no better than him. For I too am a sinner in need of God's grace. God loves you just the way you are, but he refuses to let you that way. If you're going to grow in your walk, you must be willing to allow God to help you change, to be more and more like Jesus. Can you relate? I know many of you have been holed up in your home for a long time and can't wait to get out. I'd like to use your imagination for a little while, if you will. If you would imagine with me a picture of a beautiful, sunny summer day. Temperatures are in the 80s. After church, you go to the local park with your little child, swinging in the swings and playing in the sandbox. Suddenly, you hear the clanging of a bell, and you look up, and lo and behold, there's an old-fashioned ice cream truck selling ice cream cone, fudge, and creamsicles. You look over at your little one and tell them you'll be right back as you make your way over to the truck while keeping a watch on the child. You hand the man the money for the two treats and make your way back to the sandbox where your little one is happily playing. But as you bend down to give the delicious treat to your child, you see that their mouth is full of sand. Where you intended to put a delicacy, they have put sand. My question is this, do you love your child with sand in their mouth? Well, now that's a silly question, isn't it? Of course you love them. Are they any less your child with sand in their mouth? Of course not. But your next step is an obvious one. There is no way you're going to allow them to keep sand in their mouth. You love your child so much that you refuse to let them that way. You love your child but refuse, again, to let them that way. So you carry them over to the water fountain, wash out their mouth, and give them their treat. Why? Because you love them. God is the same way. Just like the sand that got in the way of a very tasty ice cream cone, sometimes we get in the way of coming to or relinquishing our lives to the hands of God. Yes? God loves you just the way that you are, but he refuses to let you that way. If you're going to grow in your walk, you must be willing to allow God to help you change, to get the dirt out of your mouth, if you will, to be more and more like Jesus. So if you're concerned about your pre-existing conditions, take time to rejoice at the most severe pre-existing condition that you have ever had is covered. It's been covered by the death and the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Praise be to God. The praise team met this past Wednesday to record some songs to share during our time of worship. Stay tuned after this message for a song called Come As You Are. I love this song, which is performed by David Crowder. Its lyric tells us to come as we are, as sinners, come to the cross of Jesus and lay down your burdens and lay down your shame, because earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal, heaven can't cure. <laughs> as you listen to this song, the words will be on your screen. Please reflect on these words and continue to worship. 
as you follow along with this beautiful song. Please pray with me. Father God, we thank you. Thank you that you are faithful in fulfilling your promise. Your word tells us that we are redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ, and we thank you for that. You promised that if we had confessed our sins, you are faithful to forgive us and purify us. Lord, we confess that many times we turn away from you. <coughs> but we know that your mercy is far greater than our sin. We come to you now, Lord, confessing those sins and ask for your forgiveness. Lord, guide our thoughts and our deeds that we may live in a way that glorifies you. Hear our prayers, O Lord, and enable us to live for you. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you again for allowing us in your home. Please let us know if there's anything at all that we can do for you by calling either the church office or Pastor Ben or myself. Hope you all have a great day. God bless. Earth has